In this third session, um, I'm going to be talking about what I call lightweight facing type of retaining walls. Uh, many of these are described in a uh, retaining wall design guide uh, produced by the uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture Forest Service, uh, which came out of uh, Region 6 in 1979, uh, as shown on the screen right now. This is the uh, guide that I mentioned earlier in my introduction, which uh, can be obtained from uh, NTIS, and is certainly recommended uh, in terms of uh, a type of reference that goes over these systems and that maintenance people would be uh, able to build themselves. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to start the first, uh, first slides. Uh, what we see here is a system that was being used up in the uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, which is uh, or was called Stack Sack. Uh, basically, what we have here is the uh, building of a facing using uh, bagged concrete mix, uh, which is uh, obtained or purchased dry and then uh, brought out to the field. And in the field, the bags are soaked and uh, tossed around a little bit and then stacked one on top of each other. Uh, with and connected together with, uh, uh, with reinforcing bar. And to provide stability, uh, chain link fence is used as the tie back uh, up uh, at different levels uh, to, uh, to hold the system into place. Um, a few details on the uh, system. Uh, it is important, of course, like most retaining walls, to place it on a firm foundation. And uh, what they have here is they use uh, a six inch diameter reinforced concrete piles, or little small diameter holes, if you will, with a reinforcing bar placed in it. And then um, they're, they're spaced along the length of the wall, depending on uh, the type of foundation materials that you have um, and uh, the height of the wall that is ultimately going to, to be built. Uh, this is what one of these systems looks like uh, in construction. Uh, what you see here are the bags of concrete. You also notice that there's the rebar that have been uh, driven through or the bags of concrete have been speared over this rebar. Um, and they are, it's backfilled. And, and of course, since it's a fairly lightweight system, you don't want to use very heavy equipment right against the uh, front face. Uh, one uh, word of caution here in this system is that, of course, the concrete mix itself um, being delivered to the site dry uh, in bags and then only just soaked in water for a short period of time does not provide for very good concrete mixing of, of the material itself. And uh, some tests were performed on, uh, on this material, a freeze-thaw type of test, and it was found that uh, Obviously, this concrete uh, did not survive freeze-thaw uh, cycles uh, too well. So uh, if you're in very uh, high country or in an area that you go through a lot of freeze-thaw cycles, uh, this system uh, may not be uh, very good in terms of uh, long-term use. But it uh, seemed to work quite well here in the Pacific Northwest, where they do not have a lot of um, severe freeze-thaw cycles and um, uh, surviving quite well. Obviously, the uh, chain link fence is uh, introduced to, uh, to basically as a tie back to provide uh, uh, support, lateral support for the front face. And of course, at the same time as we illustrated earlier, uh, is, is a reinforcement of, of the backfill itself. Uh, here we see the uh, chain link fence being ready to tie to the top of the, uh, the, the lifts that are coming up. Uh, this is what the wall uh, looks like when it's completed. Um, of course, it's not the most beautiful thing, but uh, it uh, certainly is, is effective for, for low walls and, and works quite well. And here's another application and uh, another one, fairly high, up to about uh, 16 to 18 feet as the maximum height uh, for this system. Uh, again, it's called uh, Stack Sack and is described in the uh, U.S. Forest uh, Design Manual. Uh, as mentioned earlier, one can use 
um, grids, uh, geogrids, or metallic grids. As I mentioned in the first presentation, the commercial systems use metallic grids. Well, uh, here's an application where uh, Caltrans uh, are using the metal geogrids. And by the way, if you do use um, this type of grids, it's important that they be galvanized in terms of uh, long-term corrosion uh, resistance. But uh, these metal uh, grids uh, have been used with wooden facings on walls. Of course, this is treated wood, um, and for low walls, a couple of levels of this uh, grid can be used uh, and quite effectively, and it's, it's a quite inexpensive type of ply, uh, wall. It's plywood with uh, treated plywood and uh, treated posts tied back with these uh, metal uh, grids. There's a commercial system uh, that is basically a lightweight system. This is called a uh, Hilfiker's welded wire wall. Um, Mr. Hilfiker also, uh, Mr. Hilfiker comes from uh, Eureka, California, and uh, was, uh, has a system of reinforced soil embankment as shown in the first presentation. This other system, which is used quite uh, heavily, heavily by uh, local agencies, uh, the Forest Service also, is this welded wire wall. Uh, the reinforcement of the ground is provided by a mesh, and then the mesh is uh, turned, uh, turned at right angles uh, to form the front face, uh, as illustrated on the uh, back of this truck. One of the advantages of this system is that, of course, you can take several thousand square feet of retaining wall on um, a truck and trailer and take it to a remote site, and you do not have a lot of uh, transportation costs for if you're going to use um, concrete facing, for instance. Uh, here we see some unloading of this uh, mesh, and you can see the bent at right angles for the front face. And then some smaller mesh is used to, uh, behind this, uh, front face to contain the material behind it. And this is what one of these welded wire walls um, looks like when it's uh, in place. Uh, typical in, in place cost of this material, um, backfilled and so on, we're talking around uh, in, in western coast, around 15 to, to $18 a square foot. Um, high labor costs in the, in the west coast, which might be lower in other parts of the country. Uh, but anyway, a, a well-built uh, Hilfiger welded wire wall uh, looks like this. Um, fairly high walls have been built. Uh, this is along a state highway um, on, uh, in California. And one of the advantages of the system, of course, it's also very flexible. In this case, it, it had uh, several feet of, uh, of settlement, uh, which this system will tolerate uh, without any uh, structural distress. Um, very high walls have been built with the system, and of course they can be tiered if uh, necessary. Uh, the pipes that we see here with some, again, some instrumentation, this is one of the earlier projects. And uh, here's another illustration of a, a fairly high wall going crossing a, a small ravine. Again, uh, you see drainage coming back through, drainage behind all of these wall systems, these mechanically stabilized embankment systems, the geotextile, geogrid, and so on. Is, is important for long-term uh, stability of these uh, systems. Uh, these Hilfiker welded wire walls are very strong. Here is a, uh, an application of a temporary bridge uh, for bridge abutment for the contractor and his haul road. As you can see, very heavy loads, fully loaded scrapers crossing this interstate up in Northern California. So the system is a very strong system and, and um, in addition to being a, a much cheaper system than with the concrete uh, facing. Uh, here's another application, uh, again in, in Northern California. Um, this is what these, these systems look like. Uh, it's important to uh, go over how uh, this system is actually built because it does uh, have some peculiarities that uh, uh, make it uh, subject to potential construction problems if you not all the proper steps are taken. Uh, this slide here illustrates, uh, again, the importance of drainage. Uh, in the back of the wall, there's a drainage blanket that's placed, and in this particular case, you also see some um, 
a geotextile placed on the back of the uh, cut excavation to prevent the uh, drainage blanket from getting uh, contaminated over the long run. Now what we see here is the first lift, if you will, of the uh, welded wire wall being placed. The uh, grid is placed on a lift and you see the front face uh, sticking up at 90 degrees. Now, you can realize immediately that uh, there's no lateral support to this front face uh, and therefore it's not possible to backfill against the front face without uh, some s severe um, alignment problems. And this is why I want to go over the construction sequence on this slide in some detail. So what we see here in the uh, front portion of the, the wall, the closest to us, is a left that has been placed where the uh, welded wire fabric has, has been laid down on the previously compacted lift, comes out to the front face, and sticks up uh, vertically. In the background, uh, what we see is the next lift that has been placed. And the lift up to the next level of reinforcement has to be built um, before the front face can be backfilled. And this is where the construction sequence is a little tricky because um, what we see in the background is that the next lift of the welded wire wall has now been placed on top of the uh, soil that has been compacted. And the uh, welded wire is then extended out to the front face and the bottom of the next lift is tied or connected, there's a mechanical connection, uh, to the uh, top of the one that was previously placed. So now we have that construction sequence and we have a void uh, between, uh, the f that has to be filled, that's between the front face and the material that is being uh, compacted. Now that void has to be filled through the mesh that has been placed on the upper lift. And that is the, if you will, the tricky part of the construction of this welded wire wall. Now, if you try to place a cohesive soil, obviously it's going to be very difficult to feed through the mesh because it's going to be cohesive and sticky and so on. And you'll very likely not get good compaction. So what is done is that to get good compaction in that zone with very little compaction except for some rotting and some, and some lightweight tamping is to pour pea gravel in the front face. And with the use of pea gravel in the front face, you get a good uh, compaction of that, uh, that material and that allows you to proceed on with the construction of the wall and not uh, get excessive uh, deflection. Uh, this is a close-up of the, um, what the wall looks like with the pea gravel behind it. Again, you see also the different layers of uh, welded wire wall that are used behind the front face to keep that uh, um, pea gravel in place so it won't flow through. So there are actually, uh, there's the reinforcing, the Bend up 90 degrees, another larger a two by two inch uh, mesh that goes behind that, and then a very fine mesh to hold back the pea gravel. And this is what the uh, front face looks like when it's backfilled in the detail, and this, what you see below is the mechanical uh, connection of one lift to the next. There's no tying, no physical tying between the other, it's a mechanical connection. Now, obviously, there's some construction inspection procedures that uh, have to be followed here because if uh, you allow uh, or you do not place and do not fill this void completely with the pea gravel, uh, you're going to end up with some potential problems such as illustrated here. And, of course, that is going to translate as the wall gets higher and higher as to compression of these layers. And, of course, the wall isn't going to look nice and straight um, if that's what you, what you wanted. Structurally, it's still going to stay up, but um, if you had plans for putting something in front of it or shot creating it, as illustrated in the back of this slide, um, when it's got a lot of deflection like this, it's going to use up a lot of uh, shot creep. Typically, shot creep is not 
uh, done on top of these walls, uh, other finishing methods are also available. Most of them are just left as is, um, and are quite acceptable, certainly in, in remote areas. Uh, maybe not in, in urban areas, but uh, on the typical type of roads that we're talking about for this course, uh, it's certainly acceptable to just uh, use the weld of wire as the face. Um, this is another close-up of what happens if you try to put cohesive soil behind the front face. Um, you add load to it, and you, you, if you haven't compacted it, then the layers um, compact and, and get a lot of uh, distress. Uh, this was actually so much so that some of the connections uh, were starting to fail. So this is excessive. So compaction at the front face is important, and it's most easily obtained by placing a pea gravel in the front face. And then this is what it looks like when it's properly done. Uh, one can get vegetation to grow on the front face of these um, by uh, seeding and so on. Uh, that's, that's one alternative if you don't like the, the looks of it. Here's another application of, of uh, seeding on the front face. And um, if you want to have a what looks like a rock wall, but you don't have uh, or don't want to build a gravity structure with, with rocks, you just want to face it, you can build a hill figure well wire wall as the reinforcing or the, the structural member of the system and then just face it with uh, rock as illustrated here and here's the uh, completed structure. Obviously it looks very like, like a nice, if you will, old-fashioned type of rock walls that would be built in the past but it's actually just a, a skin on top of a, uh, a welded wire wall. Uh, here's an application of a stair step uh, embankment at the below this building. This is a commercial building in the Bay Area and this is a welded wire wall built in the stair steps. Um, in this case it's got enough rigidity on the front face that the steps will in fact stay uh, and not collapse as illustrated for the uh, geogrids uh, earlier. And of course you can get vegetation to grow. In this particular case they actually used um, Instead of that finer mesh, the steel mesh, they've used a geo grid, a mesh behind the front face to, to hold the material in place. This is not a retaining wall, but this is a, um, a uh, cut slope in some columnar uh, basalt. And it, this is in the park area. And you'll notice that the, um, this cut face has this sort of zigzaggy appearance to it. Well, they needed to build a retaining wall uh, in this park, and they want to uh, recreate this uh, from, from an aesthetic point of view. And uh, this is what was done uh, at this site. Uh, here we have, um, actually in the lower portion of the screen, we'll see it better in the next slide, but they've got a little slide. Uh, this was a, um, uh, a switchback. The road at the bottom is, goes back around and switchbacks above this. And there's a couple people at the top of the slide um, looking down. And the slide scarp is, is illustrated or can be seen in the middle of the slide. And what we can also see at the lower portion, some earlier attempts of, of correcting this, which has not, was not totally successful. But anyway, uh, to recreate this, uh, this zigzaggy effect of this column of basalt, they've used it one of these uh, welded wire walls, placed it on this, uh, on a foundation which has this uh, zigzaggy appearance and then they're going to face the wall um, and, and mortar it into place uh, with using some uh, basalt blocks. And here is what that uh, particular wall looks like. So there's a number of different ways of treating aesthetically these uh, systems uh, so that they blend into, uh, in, blend into the environment. Unfortunately, I do not have any uh, completed uh, pictures of these slides. This was under, under construction at the time um, that I took these. This is in, in Arizona. Uh, here's uh, an overall view of that uh, particular wall. Again, the facing hasn't been placed yet, but one can see the, the zigzaggy uh, attempt here. Uh, what it's going to look like in the end, I'll find out later, I guess. Uh, this is just a general shot of some um, uh, some of the um, formations uh, in Arizona. Again, uh, the attempt here is to show that uh, obviously when you have beautiful surroundings like this and you have to put retaining walls, 
uh, then you want to try to get them to uh, blend into the environment. Well, here is an attempt at this. This is a stair-step wall. It's called Cascade. It's uh, up in the, um, in, in the Flagstaff uh, area. Um, I'm sorry, it's the Sonora area of, of, um, of Arizona. And uh, here they're using a prefabricated uh, concrete facing. It's a scalloped uh, shape, as we'll see in the next few slides. And um, it's stair-step back, and it's also reinforced behind it with, with a geo grid. This was a uh, cut slope where they're having very severe problems with a rock fall, and they wanted to create an area where this rock uh, could land without um, endangering the public traveling on the roadway. And so this is what the wall looks like in the shade. And uh, here are the precast uh, elements. So this was, uh, this is a concept that was uh, uh, put together by Contax. Um, they're the people who, who market some of the geogrid systems. Um, and uh, again, uh, it's a lightweight facing. Uh, the facing is held up by these uh, concrete tiebacks, if you will, and then these are in turn reinforced with a geogrid behind it to provide additional stability. So it's a, it's a combination of a lightweight facing reinforced with a geogrid to provide stability. And of course, getting compaction between the elements, you can start seeing the stair steps and this is sort of a cross-section of this steepened slope or retaining wall. Uh, a view again at the top, a good granular backfill material close to the front face. Here we see some of the, this is a little bit later after the wall is completed, you can see that they, it is in fact working. There's some rock fall that has occurred above the slope and has landed on the upper bench without going out onto the roadway. Uh, so it is, it is being, it's quite effective. Uh, some vegetation is in the process of uh, uh, growing there, and uh, here we see the completed uh, structure from across the way. And if you look at the rock formation off to the left, and then you look at the wall, you can see how well uh, this particular system blends into uh, to the environment. Very successful uh, project as far as I'm concerned. Uh, other types of uh, uh, lightweight facing, there are some commercial products um, that are used for low type walls if, if not reinforced. Uh, this is a system called uh, Earthstone. And by the way, all these systems are described in terms of uh, where they can be obtained and addresses in a handout which I will uh, leave as part of the overall package uh, for this course. Um, all these different products are uh, listed in that uh, handout. Uh, Earthstone is just a, a prefabricated concrete block uh, interlocking which is stacked one on top of each other. Typically they are battered, a fairly uh, heavy batter if you will. Uh, again they're very lightweight so they do not go to very high heights. Uh, just a few uh, construction steps. Basically you start off initially with a um, concrete footing of some sort on firm ground that has to be formed to the shape of this, the bottom of the block, which has uh, got two slopes to it so that the blocks basically interlock. And then the blocks are just stacked one on top of each other, and of course you get alignment with using a string line. And uh, here's the first course that has been laid down on the foundation. And then the blocks themselves uh, can be uh, spaced apart, if you will, on, on lower walls. You don't need the mass. Um, and in these openings, you can get vegetation to grow. Um, and here's a double-tiered wall. This is up in, in a park area in, uh, in the Bay Area, in Walnut Creek. And uh, this is another project where the vegetation has uh, started to grow. So these walls ultimately uh, can disappear behind vegetation by the appropriate placing of vines and plants and so on uh, in the open space. Now, for higher walls, you can get a wider block. Here they are forming the uh, base again, uh, using uh, a trowel and, and a, a form with a 2 by 4 2 by 6 with the appropriate key in it. And then they start laying the blocks one on top of each other. Here we are. The wall is uh, complete. 
with this wider block, which allows they go up to higher design heights. Uh, one important step in, in all of these uh, lightweight facing and prefabricated blocks uh, systems is uh, what, we is what is illustrated right here, and that is gluing the top course of blocks down onto the lower blocks so that the top layer is sufficiently heavy that someone and the pickup truck will not come by and stop by the wall and walk away and carry your wall away. So you do want to make the top of the wall heavy enough so that it won't be vandalized. Uh, another way of reinforcing the backfill, of course, is to stabilize the backfill that is used behind these walls. And this is what was done with one of these lightweight uh, systems. Uh, here we see a, uh, a batch plant which is mixing uh, soil cement. This is just a backfill material with some percentage added to the soil. Uh, so that it will have just a few hundred PSI strengths and then placed behind as a backfill and, and over the long term, in fact, the structural element of the uh, wall itself is the uh, reinforced or cement stabilized uh, backfill material. The prefabricated block then is just the facing for, for an aesthetic uh, finish of the uh, embankment and of course also allows for good compaction behind the front face uh, while in the construction of each lift. Here they are just spreading that uh, stabilized material and compacting it. And fairly high walls have been built with these lightweight facings. You'll note that there are some rebar up on the right-hand side of this uh, slide. You'll see some bars that, or hooks that are leaning out. Those are flipped back uh, into the backfill uh, on the other side, and this is to uh, give additional stability of these high walls. Uh, this happens to be down in, uh, uh, in the uh, southern part of California where it's, these walls may be subjected to earthquakes and they want to make sure that the facing uh, stayed tied to the uh, backfill. Another interesting feature of uh, what we see here is that one can combine the open spacing and the closed spacing of this system to come up with architectural finishes. Uh, and of course, that uh, is as varied as the imagination of the people who are designing them. Uh, there is just showing the uh, hooking down of that uh, bar to, to keep the face tied into the backfill. And of course, curvilinear walls and all this kind of thing, stair steps for landscaping are possible. So that any number of combinations can be made with this. So this is a uh, soil cement a stabilized uh, wall, if you will. And it's a gravity structure. It's a, the system, the volume of soil that has been um, stabilized that actually forms the structural aspect of the what's holding back the earth. Here it's just a lightweight facing. It's just there for aesthetics. There's another uh, system that's available. It's called the uh, Laffelstein block. Um, it uh, is a system, again, that stacks one on top of each other, and this is specifically uh, designed to uh, receive the topsoil in the front face so you can get vegetation to grow on it. It uh, somewhat looks like a, one of those uh, uh, downspout uh, splash concrete things that one buys at the hardware store um, so that you don't get erosion down at the bottom of your downspout. And, uh, so here they are, uh, stacked uh, one on top of each other. This is, in, in this case, it's against a cut slope. And um, of course, being small blocks, they can be uh, maneuvered around obstacles and pipes and whatever, drainage features. And of course, they can also follow any kind of uh, line that you wish, which is quite, uh, quite pleasing and quite a nice feature of these uh, prefabricated wall systems. Here they are using uh, using it in, to steepen the bottom of a cut slope. Um, and again, the wall slope is actually varied so that at the top it actually blends into the natural slope. And with the grass growing on the front face very quickly, this will dis disappear and we'll not even uh, notice that there is a wall behind here. Here's a higher uh, system. Now each one of these systems, be it the um, earthstone or the Leffelstein block, uh, can be taken to greater heights 
with the use of um, using fabrics behind them or uh, joe grids to reinforce the backfill. This is another system, it's called Keystone. Uh, here, a different shape of concrete block. It has little pegs in between each one uh, that locks the blocks together as they are stacked one on top of each other. Again, another system that, if not reinforced, is uh, relatively limited in height. We're talking low heights, uh, 8, 10, 12 feet, or maybe a little bit more, depending on the angle of repose that is uh, used for the uh, front face. These blocks can typically be placed at uh, any, uh, many different types of angles. Here we see the um, laying of the first uh, layer of this block. Uh, this is uh, obviously taken from a brochure, but um, you can see the blocks. And then uh, on the higher walls, they, uh, this uh, geo grid uh, is placed to uh, give extra stability. And so uh, by the combination of stair stepping and reinforcing, you can get into fairly high walls with these uh, prefabricated uh, wall systems. Here's an illustration of one that's uh, about 12 to 15 feet high. Okay, that uh, concludes my uh, portion uh, number three on uh, lightweight facings. Um, This is the uh, beginning of session four in which I will discuss gravity walls and cantilevered walls. The cantilevered walls are not the type of uh, structures or the terminology that uh, one normally uses in, uh, for this type of structure such as those are found in uh, State Highway Department uh, standard plans. Uh, it will be more noticeable to uh, uh, or visible to the audience what I type I am talking about later on. Uh, may I have the first slide, please? The, uh, this particular type of retaining wall is uh, called Cribla. Uh, it comes to us uh, from New Zealand and was introduced in the United States a number of years back and is now becoming quite popular. Uh, this uh, particular wall uh, is built on a one-quarter to one a batter, uh, which allows uh, for rainfall to hit the front face and therefore get uh, vegetation to grow on the front face, which is certainly an attractive uh, feature as illustrated here. Oops. This, uh, this slide shows in more detail uh, what this system looks like when it's uh, completed. The elements of the wall are quite small and uh, they are, can be built, or the walls can be built without heavy construction equipment. The elements, or the maximum weight of the elements, is about 114 pounds and therefore can be carried by one or two individuals depending on how strong they are and incorporated into the structure as illustrated here. The, uh, basically, there are two or three elements. There are the stretcher elements, which form the front face, and then the uh, header elements, which go back into the fill. The number of bins, of course, uh, is dependent on the height of the wall that is going to be built. Uh, one of the interesting features of this is that the uh, stretcher does not um, join uh, right on top of the uh, header as illustrated here. It's cantilevered out. Uh, this allows or supposedly allow this structure to have a little bit more flexibility. Uh, however, these elements are only reinforced with a single reinforcing bar 
and therefore uh, do not have tremendous bending strength. A little case history of a little slide uh, correction. Uh, this is in uh, Rinda, California. And uh, one notices the wider width of the wall base uh, at the highest point of the wall and then narrowing down as you go uh, towards the back. And the, this particular wall was backfilled with uh, a very granular, angular type material. And uh, this option was chosen by the contractor because it uh, expedited the, con uh, the uh, construction. Because with this type of material, by in-dumping it, uh, there's relatively little compaction that is needed to get the maximum density within each type of the bin. Uh, remember, the, as you can see here, the bins are rather small. And if you put in a cohesive type material, then a lot of effort uh, of moving tampers around between the bins will have to be expended uh, to uh, backfill the structure. So there's some compensating factors here in the sense of um, is it cheaper uh, to build, uh, spend some extra money on the backfill uh, material and expedite construction, or uh, is it cheaper to use on-site material and uh, do some extra manpower in terms of construction of the wall? Uh, just a few slides showing the uh, a wall under construction. Uh, the uh, workers uh, skilled in building these walls uh, typically just walk over uh, the wall and, and uh, carry the elements and put them in place uh, without using any heavy equipment to move the uh, stretchers and headers. And this is, they build several tiers in a sequence and then uh, backfill them. Uh, it's just like uh, uh, Lego type of uh, construction. Of course, if you backfill one of these walls using this granule backfill, you're not going to get a whole lot of, of vegetation uh, growing on it. So there is that aspect of uh, using the different types of backfill uh, with this uh, crib lock wall. Uh, here is the completed uh, wall of that site, and uh, I suspect it's going to stay looking like that until some vines grow up from the bottom or uh, from the top. Not a whole lot will be uh, growing on uh, the face itself. Now, I mentioned earlier that the wall is designed to be on a uh, one and four batter. Most uh, designs of crib walls uh, in state standard specs are built on a one and six batter. Uh, the potential problem of putting a crib rock wall on a one and six batter is that the distance between the back of the stretcher and the front of the stretcher just below is given. And when you steepen up the wall, you also steepen up the angle of repose of the backfill material that has to stay there. And uh, if you use a uh, granular type fill that might erode uh, and you raise one of these walls on a one and six batter, steeper than it's originally designed for, uh, structurally, that may not be a problem, but you may have some maintenance problem with the backfill eroding through the front face, as illustrated uh, in the lower right-hand side of the uh, screen. And another detail of it um, showing this erosion problem. So it is uh, important that if you try to build these on a, on a steeper batter, that you do some uh, effort in, in terms of what kind of backfill you're going to place there. Or uh, you can also go to, as illustrated on this slide, uh, to placing a concrete block behind the front face so that the backfill won't uh, flow through it. And these are some fairly high walls in the Los Angeles area. And there's a detail showing the concrete block to prevent the backfill from coming through. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the elements are only reinforced with uh, uh, one reinforcing bar, and it's not uncommon to find little hairline cracks uh, developing in the, uh, in the structure. That doesn't seem to be a, a big problem, but it's something that uh, exists and is fairly co uh, common with this type of structure. Um, if you use other than a very clean granular backfill, this is the end result that you get. Um, 
you might get some vines to grow on this on this structure depending on what kind of uh, uh, fill you use. A, uh, another type of structure which is uh, quite common uh, around the country and has been around for a long, long, long time is uh, gabions. And uh, gabions are uh, basically wire baskets that are backfilled with rock and uh, tied together. Now these work very effectively in num a number of locations, uh, have been used in hundreds or thousands of applications very successfully. Um, I'll illustrate uh, one or two potential problems uh, with this system. Again, they are not product problems. They are problems that people, uh, or errors that people have made uh, when using this particular uh, product. Uh, one important phase, of course, is building the basket before uh, backfilling it. And here's a couple of slides showing that operation. And it's important that the uh, baskets, of course, be properly tied together because that's what's going to maintain the integrity of the system when it's put in place. They have been used very uh, successfully in a number of applications for erosion control along uh, stream banks. And uh, here they are lacing the baskets together. It is important that the baskets not be only individually uh, laced, but laced together so that there's structural integrity throughout the length of the erosion control of the wall itself. And here's some detail of this. Now this is, shows the uh, lacing using some uh, wire uh, gauge of, uh, that uh, is specified by the manufacturer. There is a trend now to go to uh, clips uh, that hold these baskets together. And a number of these different clips have been uh, tried and tested by the transportation laboratory in Caltrans in Sacramento to evaluate their effectiveness compared to the lacing procedures. And a number of these uh, clips have now been uh, approved as alternates to the, the lacing. It is important, though, to make sure that the clips are placed at every one of the uh, openings uh, adjacent to each other, up and down the seams of these uh, avian baskets. Um, one of the advantages of uh, this system that uh, other systems uh, may not have is, of course, that uh, uh, in certain weather conditions, you can't uh, pour concrete. Oh, it's not advisable to pour concrete when in freezing weather. And you can build uh, gabion walls or uh, erosion control structures in freezing weather. And that's assuming, of course, you can get the construction workers to get out and do it. Uh, a number of uh, maintenance uh, agencies around the country um, purchased the baskets from the manufacturer. And then uh, when they have small slip out problems or little widening pro uh, projects that they have, use their maintenance forces uh, to build uh, low retaining walls using these gabion baskets. Um, the, um, typically for stability, you'll notice that uh, these walls uh, will have these little struts that are included. And the, um, the manufacturers uh, show quite well in their brochures uh, how these uh, walls go together and what uh, distribution of these baskets is to be made for the various heights that one uses. And just another application of uh, a low type gabion wall. So there's literally hundreds of good applications of this product. Um, but I will discuss uh, in the next uh, few slides some potential problem, problem areas. Here is a uh, case history. This is up in the high country. This is up in around uh, Lake Tahoe, where the, uh, the original design for this cut slope, which was uh, subjected to some very severe erosion problems, uh, was to lay gabion baskets on the slope, on a uniform, uh, about a one-to-one -one slope. Now, that was the original design, and it would have worked very effectively. Only there were some very uh, severe concerns on the part of the architectural people, or the environmentalists, if you will, uh, to get some vegetation to grow on this slope. Um, that would not have been possible if the uh, gabions had been laid flat on the slope. Uh, so therefore, they changed the design and put it into a tiered system. And of course, the idea here was to uh, get vegetation to grow uh, on these little steps that have been built by these uh, retaining walls. The 
the, each individual retaining wall is somewhere in the order of six to eight feet high up and down the slope. Now I mentioned that uh, uh, we're in high country. This, this elevation here is about uh, 7,000 feet. And of course, uh, uh, it, uh, it gets very cold in the winter. And uh, after just one or two winters, uh, some very severe uh, distress was noticed uh, on these slopes. And of course, uh, uh, the reason we have it is we got snow during the winter. And of course, it, in the springtime, the uh, snow melts. And uh, in the springtime, uh, when the snow melts, it also freezes at nighttime. And this, uh, these gaping baskets, of course, having a lot of voids, uh, allows a frost penetration to go fairly deep into the ground. So at the critical time of period of year in the springtime, what we have a situation here is we've got cut slopes that get a lot of water from the melting snow, and at nighttime, this backfill behind the gabion walls themselves uh, freeze. And in effect, what we have is mini dams that are being built on this slope. And this hydrostatic pressure of the water behind the uh, frozen backfill is pushing uh, against the walls, and we have the distress that is illustrated uh, on this uh, slide. So very, very rapidly, in a matter of two or three years, uh, these walls were being pushed over, backed over by the ice um, formation. And of course, once they started leaning over sufficiently, then uh, gravity did the rest and brought basically all of these walls down. And every one of these had to be completely rebuilt. And uh, of course, that's a very expensive uh, venture. Uh, it's, it's difficult to build a gabion wall on top of a slope. It's even more difficult to take one down. There's you know, safety problems and so on. So uh, it's, you know, it was a change in design which was not totally thought through in terms of um, what is actually going to happen in the environment that surrounds these walls. And it's basically, it's a mistake that um, is one that uh, I've seen repeated uh, a number of times with the system is that because the wall material itself is porous, one does not consider that it has to be drained. And because of that, um, people have made these mistakes and mistakes in design. Again, it's not the product's fault. It's a misapplication, uh, a misunderstanding of, of the forces involved, uh, and particularly the forces of water. Uh, that can happen behind uh, a wall of this type. And so all of these had to be rebuilt and um, they were, struts were added uh, for additional stability. And this is what this wall looks like today. So remember, uh, any one of these wall systems, uh, be it Gabions or any of the other type that uh, I've talked about, uh, it, drainage is a very important feature of these systems. Uh, another very good application of gabions is one illustrated here, and that's in rockfall control. Gabions are massive. Um, they are also flexible, and they will absorb a lot of energy uh, that is created by a rock rolling down the slope and then uh, hitting it. So they will absorb a lot of energy, and they are used very effectively in controlling rock and making an area to collect the rock so that maintenance can come in later and then uh, remove the, the debris that's fallen down. So this is another very good application of, of gabions, gabion walls. Of course, they're not really retaining soil at this stage. They're providing an area for collection of uh, material behind them. And when they're fill, full, of course, they, are, they become retaining walls also. But they are very flexible. One thing that you do not want to use for rockfall control is the use of a concrete retaining structure. And uh, the reason there, of course, is you get a rock uh, rolling off the slope and it hits the top of the wall and then bounces onto the road and you not only have the rock on the road that you wanted to prevent getting there, but you now have a chunk of piece of your concrete wall and the poor motorist, instead of having one obstacle to go around, uh, has uh, one or, or two or more, uh, depending on how much of the wall has, uh, has been chipped off. 
So Gavin is very good for rock wall control and a number of other applications. One just has to remember that uh, if one is in the high country, you can get freezing the back bill behind, which makes it impermeable. Or if one decides to place a very clay backfill behind a wall like this, then of course uh, the permeability of the clay is very low and you can have hydrostatic forces uh, building up behind uh, uh, Gavian wall also. Uh, there are basically two manufacturers uh, around the country of the twisted wire Gavians. Um, and uh, that's the McFerry and, and Beckert uh, type, and the uh, another type has uh, recently come onto the market. It's uh, produced by Mr. Hilfiger again out of Northern California. It is the welded wire uh, gabion, and the gabion come uh, again folded uh, to the project site, and then uh, they are uh, opened up just like cardboard boxes, and there are spiral connections to lace the um, the corners of these baskets, and uh, they can be used on just the same application as the other application. So uh, that I mentioned with the other twisted wire gavings. So uh, there are alternates, of basically, if you will, three manufacturers of different types of uh, gavings, uh, three major manufacturers of gavings uh, on the market today. Here's some completed projects uh, in California. Uh, using the welded wire uh, gabion. The, the welded wire is, of course, uh, galvanized. Uh, there was some concern with the use of the welded wire gabion that um, it would be uh, too rigid and would not be flexible enough in the, in the application of, of um, erosion control and mattress applications. You know. And what we see here and in the next slide is a test of the flexibility of the welded wire gabion. Here it is set up and the next one under the test. It was a very simple test. Uh, there was just six boards that were 12 inches wide and then uh, one by one they were knocked out and uh, the mattress was basically cantilevered until it touched the ground and then inspection was made of the uh, the wire, the welded connections to make sure that they were still intact. Originally, the t test failed, and after a uh, number of modifications to the uh, system, the, uh, Mr. Hilfiger has found the right combination of gauge so that they are now accepted for mattresses also uh, as alternates to the twisted wire gabions in mattress applications in California. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, crib walls uh, built out of wood. And, and a number of states have them. Uh, this is an old one that I uh, took a picture of in, in Northern California. Um, but there are also some commercial versions of this. Uh, this is something called permacrib. It comes out of uh, Southern California. And uh, basically the elements are very small elements, uh, basically two by four, two by six uh, inch size lumber, which is fully treated throughout for long-term preservation in terms of uh, for performance so that you do not get uh, quick deterioration of the material. And a number of walls have been built with this system. Uh, here's a fairly a high one. And again, uh, if you use good granular backfill, you have good shear strength, and it's basically a gravity-type structure uh, using lightweight uh, wood uh, facing for the, for the elements. And of course, with some, um, some cohesive material uh, on the front face, or close to the front face, you can get vegetation to grow on these uh, also. A number of uh, agencies uh, have used a concrete block, just precast concrete block, and of course, if you make them big enough and stack them one on top of each other, you have uh, gravity-type structures for uh, low-type retaining walls. Of course, in this case, uh, as you can see by the scale of the workers, uh, these are fairly large concrete blocks, and you need uh, heavy equipment to be able to lower them in, in place. Um, cantilevered walls, in, in the sense that I'm using them in this workshop, are uh, basically types of systems where a vertical element is either driven or drilled into the soil uh, 
to sufficient depths so that its lateral resistance in the foundation material will support the soil that is placed um, in the portion of the wall that is uh, above the soil, and that's illustrated in the, um, in the slide below, uh, in the lower portion of the slide. Um, you can use sheet pile driven, H piles are driven, uh, concrete cylinder piles, which are typically um, drilled into place. Uh, one thing that one has to remember that if one places these on very steep slopes, that the uh, forces against the wall um, go up with the square of the height of the wall. So if you lose lateral resistance in front of the toe uh, of the wall, then the forces on the wall itself go up very rapidly. And this is one area that uh, is uh, very important to understand, and that's why you need to get your friendly soil mechanic or geotechnical engineer to make sure that you put the foundations deep enough to resist the um, forces uh, involved. Uh, just a few applications here. Again, some uh, projects from the done by the Forest Service where you drive piles or sheet piles, and uh, that is quite sufficient for, for low walls, and, and uh, if you've got the right equipment, uh, quite effective um, retaining structures. Uh, you've got to be careful, again, like I mentioned, to get them into firm foundation and not make them too high, um, because then you've got to tie them back or do some additional structural analysis to make sure that the vertical element is, su is sufficiently strong to hold back the soils. Uh, if they get very high, then of course you can add uh, anchors at the top, as illustrated in this lower portion of the slide here, in the graph portion of the slide, uh, to provide additional uh, stability. I guess you could also reinforce the backfill with geotextiles or, or whatever other elements that we've talked about. But if you're getting the very high walls of this type, uh, you've got to add an additional lateral stability by placing some kind of anchors. A uh, couple of illustrations of this. Now here's a, one of these walls where you have the H piles driven and then, uh, then the precast elements placed in the web of the, uh, of the vertical element that has been driven into the ground. Um, if you think about this, um, it may look very nice because the front face um, looks smooth at the end but uh, there are some construction problems that are involved, and I'll illustrate those with this little, um, little uh, case history here. Here's a little slide uh, occurring in Walnut Creek, California, and here's the uh, vertical elements that have been placed in the ground, and um, I drive by this place uh, very frequently and was wondering why this project stayed in this status for so long. And it's only after I saw the completed wall that I realized why it taken so long. Every element here of the precast wall is of a different height. And because they wanted to place them between the uh, structural elements, they individually have to be measured before, um, before they could be placed uh, into the wall. So that is a very tedious uh, process. And if you want to place the placing flush with a structural element, that's something you have to consider. Uh, much better is to uh, place the um, bracing elements or uh, supporting elements behind the vertical element as illustrated here. And this is done um, and illustrated on this project. It's much easier to build, much easier to modify in the field if you put the uh, lagging behind the vertical element. And it can be concrete, it can be wood, a number of different materials can be used uh, for the lagging. Illustrated here is some concrete vertical um, sections with treated wood behind it. Obviously, the treated wood can be cut to size and then um, additional treatment done before placed uh, behind the wall. Uh, again, you've got to make sure you understand the forces of the slide. Uh, here is a case where it wasn't built uh, strong enough and the slide completely wiped out the wall. And this is why you need to have good geotechnical investigation uh, for these types of cantilevered structures. Uh, one last uh, case history was one where a massive slide occurred on uh, 
Route 50 up in, in Nevada and uh, Lake Tahoe area. And uh, one morning, the embankment completely disappeared, liquefied, went down the slope, and uh, took all four lanes out. And there was a need to come up with a solution to get traffic going um, back on this road, which was heavily traveled and leading also down to uh, South Lake Tahoe, which is a recreation area and uh, depends a lot on the money brought in by people coming along this roadway. So it was very uh, necessary to come up with a solution that was quick and uh, could open to traffic so that uh, um, the traffic would, well, could go on through. And the solution chosen was uh, driven H piles. Um, all the piles were driven and then cut off at the top and the cut off sections were driven on the other side of the roadway and then the two sides tied together with rock bolts uh, or anchors, bolts between the, uh, between the front and the back. And for facing, just used recycled uh, guardrail, uh, which turned out to be available from a local maintenance yard. And the roadway was reopened in a bit, very short period of time and uh, much to much to the pleasure of the uh, director of the Department of Transportation. Uh, that's all I have for this particular uh, portion of the presentation. This is the beginning of session five, and the types of retaining walls that I'll be talking about here are um, walls made with salvaged materials or other common type of uh, materials that one finds on highway projects such as uh, pipes and so on. Uh, with that, uh, let's start with the first slide. Uh, what we see here is a, an application of a salvaged material. This is done on a private uh, sector. It's just using uh, railroad ties which are commonly available all around the country. On this particular case, the walls are very low, and therefore they're just uh, stacked together. Typically, uh, large spikes are driven through them to uh, put some uh, stability to them. Uh, this is a project in Colorado where the uh, engineers used the combination of the railroad ties and a geotextile to reinforce the backfill to build this uh, particular wall. You'll notice that it actually has an open face uh, appearance, so that it's not a, a completely uh, covered with uh, railroad ties. Uh, how is this uh, built? Here's the front view. They have uh, a short sections that are used to stack the, uh, the railroad ties one on top of each other. And then uh, in between the open spaces, we'll see that there is a two by four um, board that is placed, and uh, we'll see this in the next cross-section, how this is, works to, to reinforce the backfill and keep the backfill from flowing through the front face. Uh, basically what we have is the backfill is reinforced with a uh, geotextile or a geogrid, and uh, two by four boards are placed uh, on the front face to uh, the hold the geotextile or geogrid to the uh, top of the railroad tie, as illustrated and detailed here. Uh, what you have is the uh, railroad tie on the bottom, and then the geotextile or the geogrid is brought uh, horizontally to the top of the railroad tie, and then wrapped around the two by four, which is placed horizontally, and then nailed uh, down uh, onto the railroad tie. Now this is done in the open space uh, that we saw on the, on the face of the, this retaining wall system. And then a two by four is uh, placed vertically and nailed in place. And this two by four uh, does two functions. One, it uh, lowers the angle of, of uh, repose of the material that's placed uh, in the backfill. Um, and also it protects the uh, geotextile or geogrid from exposure to um, ultraviolet light. Another 
a very similar type of application is another railroad tie wall, which I uh, showed in, briefly in presentation two, where railroad ties were combined with geogrids uh, to build a, about a 12 to 15 foot high uh, retaining wall. And here we see the recycled railroad ties. These are old railroad ties. And uh, in the backfill, we see in the background the uh, geogrid. The geogrid um, is one of those that is of the thinner type. This is the Mirafi, uh, which is stapled to the top of the railroad tie and then uh, laid horizontally in the backfill. As mentioned earlier, this would not be done at each level. The geogrid would not be placed at each level, but maybe every two or three um, ties uh, vertically so that you'd have a spacing of 14, 21, multiples of, of seven since that was the uh, size uh, of the uh, railroad tie. Then, of course, just regular backfill material. The railroad ties provide the horizontal support there to get good compaction along the front face. And here is a completed uh, salvaged guard rail uh, reinforced with a gel grid. Uh, here's kind of an experimental uh, project that was built in uh, around Santa Cruz in California. Uh, this was done in about uh, 1977. And the results of this project uh, led to the development of a system which I will talk about a little bit later on. Uh, there is a concern of how to get rid of uh, tires and because we generate millions of tires per year. And so the state was looking at various options of how they could use uh, old tires uh, to build embankments and, and so on, reinforce embankments. And this was a, a landslide site, and what they wanted to do to reduce the driving forces was to be able to steepen the front face of the embankment up to about one half to one, uh, horizontal to vertical, and reinforce the embankment uh, using sidewalls of tires, not using the whole tire, but just the sidewalls. It turned out that in the Bay Area, there was a company that stripped the uh, treads of tires off um, t the tires to uh, send the treads back to the Far East, where these would then be used for um, sandal soles, uh, doormats, and, and this type of product. And this was actually a waste product that uh, was being generated. And so um, Caltrans looked into how uh, this could be used to reinforce embankment. Here we see them bringing the sidewall tires to the site on the pickup truck, just unloading them off. And here they are just putting them fairly random initially, and then using a um, bent rebar clip, as illustrated here, tying all the sidewalls of tires together um, in a basically a uh, square fashion. So each tire has uh, four clips in it, as illustrated right here. It turns out that these sidewalls of these tires have tremendous pullout resistance, and this was as known as a result of some laboratory tests that were done in large direct shear box. And uh, so here's an illustration of different configurations of clipping these tires together, but basically they were laid out in large mats and ev then a total of two feet of uh, fill placed before the next uh, mat of tire sidewalls was placed. So here we see from the top of the cut uh, laying out these tires, and then when it's all laid out in a nice even grid pattern, and then backfilling with, with soil, and uh, then placing uh, additional uh, material, spreading it out, compacting it, there's also some instrumentation that was performed on the site um, to look at the behavior of the overall embankment. And as the embankment comes up, this is what we see. And then to maintain stability of the front face, chicken wire was uh, used to maintain the temporary uh, slope of one half to one, um, or hold it at half to one until grasses grew and reinforced it with natural roots. And this is what the uh, completed embankment looked like. So this is a tire sidewall reinforced embankment, uh, a rather unique application. Of course, uh
molded and then a little bit of galvanizing placed on it to uh, prevent long-term corrosion. And then the use of tire sidewalls, it really doesn't matter, they can come in all different sizes. And then here are the uh, cross arms to this uh, tie back bar that's laid in the fill to which the tire sidewalls are anchored. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the state has run pullout tests and there's tremendous resistance to pull out with the use or the added uh, strength and, and uh, passive resistance provided by the, uh, the tire sidewall. Of course, then the wall is backfilled and uh, completed. This is, like I said, one of the first walls in which they used recycled um, railroad ties. Um, they have also uh, used this concept in a number of other applications, uh, but typically have found that um, for permanent projects that are, let's say, exposed to visual view of, of a number of people, that they have gone to new railroad ties, which turn out to be not that much more expensive than the recycled uh, ties, because uh, in the recycled ties, uh, the contractor would typically have to sift through a large number of ties to find uh, a number that would fit the wall without uh, going out of, of tolerance. So the cost of new ties and, and new construction um, was compensated by the fact that these systems can go together quite rapidly. Um, and also with the use, of course, of very little heavy equipment. Uh, basically, the elements, the biggest elements are the railroad ties and the, and the vertical members. And the rest can be built uh, quite rapidly and very, not much uh, skilled labor uh, involved in this. Uh, some very, a few high walls have been built. This is in, an, in the landslide application where Phil failed and they wanted to flatten the slope and they used uh, tiers of these tire anchor timber walls to, uh, to reestablish the slope. And here we see the, um, the backfill uh, with the tire uh, anchors in it. Uh, in the background, a very extensive drainage system was also installed because this was a very massive uh, embankment. Uh, this was in the uh, San Francisco Bay area. A number of other smaller walls have been also been used with this system, and you can also see the um, guardrail used for a rub rail along the, along the base of it. This was used to flatten the slope because there was a very uh, rotable uh, soil above it, and just slight flattening was allowed for vegetation to, to grow on it. Um, this uh, concept of uh, trying to find applications for recycled uh, or old tires uh, has also been uh, developed further by, by Caltrans and uh, they have come up with a, uh, a system where they just use the whole tire for relatively low walls. We're talking three, four, five, six feet. And uh, this, this a whole, uh, there was a whole research effort that was put into this and an extensive report that covers the application of uh, this type of system has been developed and as of uh, this date, which is the uh, 23rd of June, uh, they expect that by the end of this month that an implementation package, uh, the combination of a brochure along with a slide tape uh, visual uh, presentation will be available for their maintenance and uh, more information on that uh, can be obtained through the transportation laboratory in uh, Sacramento, California. Anyway, this is a typical uh, problem uh, on county roads, uh, over steep and side slopes, uh, erosion problems, and um, here they are, they've stacked about four or five layers of uh, old tires, uh, backfilled them, and uh, this allows to uh, flatten the slope and uh, reduce, and reduce this uh, erosion problem. They've also uh, used this uh, along stream banks to uh, reduce erosion. This is a slide of uh, site before the application of these uh, tire walls. Uh, here's the tire walls in place after uh, construction. And here's a little bit later on where vegetation has uh, recovered and uh, 
hopefully will provide long-term erosion resistance by the fact that it's now a flattened slope and the tires are there to reinforce the toe of the slope. So here is a uh, variation on using old tires for providing additional stability uh, in uh, these slope maintenance problems. Uh, other applications and other salvageable materials are uh, god rail or sheet piles and number of, again a number of applications by the Forest Service uh, are going to be illustrated. Here's one where uh, they use the horizontal sheet piles with uh, small tiebacks. These tiebacks could be any number of things as I'll illustrate a little bit later on. This is what one of those walls uh, looks like. It's not the most beautiful thing, but again, it's, it's effective. It's a way of getting across uh, small swale and so on. Um, here is a more uh, significant wall using guardrail, salvaged guardrail. This is a double rail. Um, this is a wall in, in um, near the Santa Barbara area in Southern California. And this was basically a wall built with uh, materials available to maintenance in their maintenance yards. And here we see the uh, W rail in the front face. And what they used was a, a bent clip to uh, hold the face in place and a vertical rod to stack these uh, W guardrails one on top of each other. And the original intent was to use a salvaged uh, guardrail, uh, not, sal not guardrail, but salvaged uh, uh, delineated posts for the anchor uh, rods. And that, uh, in this particular case, it turned out that they didn't have enough, so I believe these slides, well, these slides show some, some of the newer um, delineated posts being used for the tiebacks. This is shown in the lower right-hand corner of the, of the slide here. And then they also used a, a crossbar in the back to provide a little additional pull-out resistance, although in this case, it probably wasn't necessary to have uh, that, that anchor rod in the back. The friction, uh, it was good backfill material and the friction between the, um, the post and uh, the soil would probably be sufficient. Uh, here we are, just another phase of stacking those uh, guardrail one on top of each, of each other with this, uh, with this clip. And uh, again, another view of the completed uh, structure. It's a reasonable appearance, certainly. Um, obviously, if you want to paint that uh, and make it prettier, that can also uh, be accomplished. There's some really old guardrail around. Uh, I'm not even sure what this, uh, this is named anymore. Um, but uh, we were playing around in the maintenance yard with this old guardrail, and it turns out that uh, the, the state is also replacing a lot of the median guardrail that used to have rub rail um, on it. And uh, they have literally miles of this rub rail, which they can't uh, give back to the salvage yard because it's uh, so heavily um, coated with this um, uh, corrosion protection device, the galvanizing, that uh, they won't take it back. And so um, what we did here was uh, try to devise a system that uh, we could use the salvage guardrail and these salvaged rails from the rub rails and uh, come up with a little uh, retaining wall system, and this is what we came up with. Um, the rub rail uh, at one end had the anchor block, or a, a little connecting plate, and through that connecting plate one could place a vertical bar, and then against the bar we could use this old guardrail. And then if you really think about it, uh, this system looks very much like one of the original uh, facings that uh, the Reinforced Earth Company had for, the, for their product. So here we're combining salvaged guardrail on the front face uh, with this rub rail and, and coming up with a system that uh, potentially could work. I must admit at this stage that uh, um, none have actually been built. This was uh, something that we were playing around with, but uh, certainly with a little bit more thought to it, uh, could be low walls could be built with this system. And basically they're all uh, salvaged or, or waste materials. And uh, this is what we conceived as, as how the system would, uh, would go together. Uh, 
Other systems that have been around, um, Kaiser Aluminum for a few years uh, promoted this system uh, was using basically pipe. Uh, large diameter pipe stood on end, typically battered, one in six. And then these pipes would be backfilled uh, with material and then the wall would be built. And this is what uh, this wall system looked like when it was uh, completed. In this case, of course, it's uh, being painted. And uh, our direct federal office and Federal Highway Administration built a, a number of these uh, walls. And this is dating back a few years. Now, this concept has been taken by a county in uh, Northern California, Sonoma County, and uh, they have come up with what they call the can wall. And basically what they've taken is a drainage pipe uh, and they stand it on end, it's battered, and uh, put them adjacent to each other, and uh, there's very loose connection between, between each one, each one is a small bolt, and uh, I will be leaving with the instructors uh, some standard plans uh, for this uh, particular system that the county has developed, and uh, they have used it on a number of, of uh, applications. Uh, typically, the, uh, you need a pipe diameter that um, uh, is such that the height of the wall on this batter, uh, one in six batter, uh, does not exceed twice the diameter of the pipe. That's unless you uh, place a concrete footing to uh, give additional stability. Uh, one of the key features in the system is to have a good draining backfill and also a good uh, type of material that you place within the cans so that uh, uh, it's pre-draining and, of course, we'll get to its maximum density with minimum compaction effort because you're not going to do a whole lot of compaction in these small, uh, small pipes. Uh, at the toe of this uh, wall, they just use a, a redwood uh, board to get proper alignment um, as a foundation level here. And then there's another view of it. You can see the batter, fairly well aligned. Obviously, the guardrail is, is not meant for um, highway, uh, freeway speeds. It's just more as a delineator, but uh, seems to be work quite uh, satisfactorily. Again, here's a close-up of the guardrail situation and of this nice, clean, granular backfill. It has a fi high friction angle. Of course, if you use also that behind the um, retaining wall, you have high friction angle material, which is low forces against the wall, and, and this wall works quite well. You can get quite good alignment, as illustrated by this slide. And a view from below. It's just uh, tangent, the, the cans are just uh, tangent to each other. And uh, another detail of the toe with the board for the alignment, the granular backfill. The joints are sometimes open. And in this case, the granular backfill bridges between the, the gaps. There's no problem there and sometimes they're like this. Being on a batter, of course, it's the opening is going to vary as you go around uh, curves, and that is something that uh, has to be taken into consideration when, when building the wall. A number of applications are, and obviously they have confidence in this wall as illustrated uh, right adjacent to this uh, residence. If you want to little, do a little bit of landscaping or mask the uh, shape of this, you can put a little bit of redwood lattice and get some vines to grow on it and uh, quite an effective little system. Another sh shot of it. Uh, they also have taken the same concept but taken only half of pipes and then added tie backs for additional stability. Uh, this could also be done with the same uh, concept. This, this concept here, uh, vertical uh, can walls, was uh, originally developed by the Forest Service and is described in that Forest Service uh, retaining wall um, manual that I discussed in uh, in presentation um, in the previous presentation, uh, and this is what this system looks like. Very similar. Of course, this is a higher wall, but it's just additional stability has been given through uh, the use of uh, tiebacks, and the wall has been tiered. Okay, this uh, concludes uh, this uh, portion of these walls with uh, uh, salvaged materials.
This is the beginning of ses session six and the last session that I will be presenting on retaining walls um, for this course. Uh, this particular session is entitled Soil Erosion and Soil Bioengineering. And it is one that uh, basically um, what I'm going to try to illustrate is some applications of concepts to uh, reduce the erosion control problems that uh, various agencies have um, experienced. Now, uh, for erosion control, a number of agencies have used uh, fabrics, erosion control fabrics and erosion fences, uh, as illustrated here, to uh, catch runoff from projects either on the construction or uh, whatever, any problems in areas they might have uh, problems with. Uh, here we see uh, a, a fence that's set up with a chain link and then uh, fabric on one side to uh, catch this erosion. Uh, this application here is see where one of these fences is uh, almost uh, going to be overtopped. And what we've got here is the, the topsoil has eroded down the slope and has now uh, filled in behind these, these fences. Now, uh, this in turn, of course, is good because it prevents the material from going on down the stream. But uh, you want to be able to control this. And uh, if you could get vegetation to, to grow on a permanent basis, uh, then this, this would uh, work quite well. And this little uh, case history, that, uh, some applications, actually this uh, comes to us from France, is, uh, illustrates how uh, stair-stepping these erosion control fences and can be revegetized on, on very steep slopes. And here, what we see here is a number of these soil erosion slopes. Note how bare uh, all the slopes around it are. It's, it's over-steepened. You can't get any vegetation to grow on it. And what they've done in here is come along and build a number of erosion control fences, which are backfilled to almost horizontal. And then through the front face and in this backfill area, which is going to collect water, um, shoots, such as willow shoots, are stuck into the uh, fabric. And uh, with time, these willow shoots will uh, root. And the backfill itself will get reinforced with nature's own reinforcement, which is the, their roots, and the, the site uh, will become uh, stable. You see very quickly that these uh, shoots uh, vegetate, and uh, of course you've got to get the right kind of shoots, and I'm not a, uh, the, the, the person to be able to advise you on that, but uh, get, get your friendly uh, landscape architect or someone that's knowledgeable about the types of plants that reroute very easily and uh, work with them and combine this system of silt fences, if you will, with uh, this plant material to get a slope that will completely revegetate. And here is what the site looks like uh, a few months later. Note that the ground all around it is completely bare. The site where the uh, silt fences and the uh, shoots have been placed is now nice and green and will provide uh, long-term erosion control. Uh, this same concept is, is, <coughs> is uh, basically uh, being used by a number of different people and it's called uh, soil bioengineering, the combination of plant material and uh, some of the newer um, reinforcement materials such as geogrids discussed earlier. These two combine uh, are being used quite effectively along uh, various rivers to control uh, soil erosion. Here we see a project um, combining the geogrids with cuttings that have been taken from local vegetations, the type of cuttings that will reroute, and those placed in horizontal layers, uh, and the additional use of a geogrid to reinforce the soil um, temporarily at least until the roots completely uh, reinforce the soil. Uh, this combination comes up with something that's called soil bioengineering, which is very effective in controlling erosion along streams and so on. And we see the backfilling of this plant material. And with time, um, it uh, revegetates and uh, the slope becomes uh, erosion proof. 
Uh, another concept, another project using the, the same concept. Um, here we see them laying out the geogrid in building of this embankment, which is being basically cut. Um, and this then uh, vegetation is placed. Uh, this typically uh, has to be done uh, during the winter or in the dormant stages of this um, of these this plant material, and this is why you want to make sure that you consult the appropriate people that are knowledgeable about the plant materials in your area uh, that will in fact uh, tolerate being cutting and buried in the ground and expected to reshoot. Here's the backfilling of that uh, project of this embankment, uh, another angle of it, and then uh, there it is just after. Uh, the project has been completed. It doesn't look uh, great at this stage, but then with time, uh, vegetation takes over and you've got a erosion-controlled uh, embankment and a steepened embankment also. Uh, there's also uh, something called live crib walls, uh, again using the same concept where uh, intermixing a structural element in this case, it's a crib wall uh, using wooden uh, members uh, with plant material. Those combined and backfilled will reinforce all of that soil with nature's own roots, and you'll end up with a, um, a wall system that is uh, very strong. Here we see the first phases of one of these projects, where in this case, the uh, crib wall is just being built with, with logs, not even treated logs. Um, and then on top of these, or between these, this plant material is laid out and then backfilled with soil. And this is what a, the project looks like when it's uh, completed. Uh, at this stage, it's uh, nothing very beautiful, but if you wait two or three months and presto, you've got a live crib wall. Uh, so this is some of the things that are uh, being used today. There's a lot of interest around the country uh, for this uh, subject, soil bioengineering. There are actually international conferences um, and national conferences on the subject. And uh, it's something that we, I think, in the future will see more and more application um, for these types of problems, these soil erosion and slope stability problems. Uh, I want to conclude with something that um, I've uh, seen just a couple of years ago for the first time. Uh, and this is in France, and this is a concept uh, which is actually patented. It's called uh, Texol, but uh, if you remember in the first presentation, I showed you the use of geotextiles, which are uh, materials, which are fibers, which are woven or non-woven, placed in uh, through some kind of mechanical process and made into sheets. Uh, which are then put into rolls, and then we take them out to the field and build the uh, geotextile walls. The, Fr the French have uh, developed a concept where instead of going through the manufacturing process of taking these fibers uh, and making sheets out of them, they just take them directly from the rolls, which the manufacturers use, um, and with these rolls, they uh, shoot they have a, um, a piece of equipment that can unwind these rolls at very high rate and then build uh, or shoot these fibers out at the same time as they back filling uh, the area with a conveyor belt and sandy material. And they've been using this uh, to reinforce slopes along freeways in, in France where they've gone into cuts and they want to widen the cut to, to increase uh, adding another lane, and then uh, this uh, material, this mixture of fibers and soil is placed back in as a buttress. And uh, this is kind of a down the, down the road type of application. And here are some slopes along the freeways. Uh, they're just only recently being completed and haven't uh, completely revegetated yet. But uh, here's a close-up view where we see these fibers that are intermixed with the sandy backfill. And uh, in this particular case, the slope is about a, a 45 degree slope. It's just sand and these fibers. Now there's 
a tremendous amount of fibers in, in this. And it's rather unique in the sense that uh, uh, by weight it's very small. It's, it's about 0.1 to 0.2 percent by weight of the backfill, the fibers. So we're talking by weight, we're talking about very small quantities. Um, but if you look at an individual fiber, which only uh, weighs maybe one or two ounces per mile, uh, it turns out that in each cubic yard of backfill, there's somewhere around 50 to 60 miles of fiber in each cubic yard. And that is a tremendous amount of fiber. What's unique, though, uh, it, there's not enough of it to change the permeability of the backfill, but there's enough of it to give it very high cohesion. So you now have a new material uh, in, terms of, in terms of geotechnical materials that has high friction because you're starting off with the sand and it also high, has high cohesion, uh, which is normally something that we'd only expect out of clays. So that combination allows you to design slopes that are much steeper than nature would allow them. And uh, here's a close-up of what these fibers look like when you dig them out. This is, I went up close and started digging. I couldn't dig any further than the length of my uh, fingers because there was so much fiber in there. And of course, this in com combination with the roots of the, uh, the grasses that are, are um, uh, grow growing on the slope uh, will reinforce the slope and, and protect it from further erosion. And here is a 60 degree slope, basically sand, uh, reinforced with the fiber and now vegetated. So this is a little look into the future of uh, what we will see. Uh, there are a number of people very interested in this concept. Uh, what I've attempted to, uh, to do today in, in these presentations of these different retaining wall systems is answer those questions I had in the beginning is one, what types of retaining walls are available, and, and hopefully I've covered that adequately, and by showing the different types of construction uh, procedures, I've been able to show you what type of retaining walls uh, fit the site. And uh, with that, I've only got uh, one more slide, and uh, wish you goodbye, and I uh, hope it's time for this in your part of the country.